Welcome to Energy Insights. Today, we're speaking with Suzanne Wong. Suzanne is the Asia Program Manager at Research, Communication and Advocacy Organization, Oil Change International, and she works with an international and Japanese-led coalition in pressuring the Japanese government to change course on fossil fuels. Previously, Suzanne worked on issues and campaigns that affected communities by megaprojects in marginalized countries and regions, from Laos to the United States. In today's episode, we mainly talk about the upcoming G7 summit in Hiroshima, where Japan is now chair of the group in 2023. We go over issues related to Japan's insistence on seeing more investments in gas-related infrastructure, the recent G7 energy ministers meeting that took place in Sapporo in the run-up to the G7, Japan's foreign energy policy and its impacts on Southeast Asian countries, the problems with an over-reliance of gas for countries like Bangladesh, where Japan is now supporting its energy development, and other topics. It was great to get Suzanne on the podcast, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, so we are here with Suzanne Wong. Suzanne, thank you so much for coming on Energy Insights. It's a, it's a pleasure to get you on here. And while I would have introduced you to, to listeners beforehand, I always like to give our guests a opportunity to tell us about themselves and their background and, and what they're working on. Uh, well, thanks so much, Ashley, for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. I'm the Asia Program Manager at Oil Change International, which is an international NGO that works to speed the ongoing transition to clean energy. I've been working on social and environmental justice issues for over 25 years now, and I've been so privileged to spend a lot of that time supporting coalitions fighting for just and sustainable development. Um, One of those is the Fossil Free Japan Coalition, which is an international coalition of dozens of civil society organizations and movements in Japan and across the world working to end Japan's support for gas, coal, and oil. Today, I did want to talk about all things energy-related and especially G7-related, given that the summit is about to take place in Japan later this month. But first, I'm just curious to ask, what attracted you to to working on, on for example, you mentioned justice issues um and you've been in this field for 25 years what was was this an unfolding journey or was there a certain moment where it kind of all just clicked for you um i think i've always been committed to like helping both protect the environment and support the rights of communities who depend on it which is pretty much all of us and so i really have appreciated the opportunity whether it's fighting against dams fighting against you know big tech development and like displacement of communities uh, in the Bay Area in California, or fighting against coal or gas projects across Asia. Like, I think it's all tied to the same problematic development model that that basically sacrifices the rights of people and communities and ecosystems for profit. Awesome. So without further ado, let's let's jump into the upcoming G7 summit. Now, I think it would be um, useful just for context if we step back a bit and try to go over like a brief summary of, of what happened in last year's summit in, in Germany. Um, now, it's only been one year, but the world has you know changed significantly since then. But if I do remember correctly, last year, there was quite a bit of criticism thrown at the G7 for its lack of leadership on energy issues during that time, given that they were talking about putting more money into gas and putting more support into gas-related infrastructure given Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I was just wondering what your take on last year uh, was and and the critiques on the, the lack of leadership shown by the G7 last year. Last year, basically one of the most significant things that the G7 did was committing to end international public finance for fossil fuels by the end of 2022. It was actually of of all the things, of all the bluster, all the promises, all the commitments that doesn't amount to nearly enough uh, strong action to address the climate crisis. This was actually a huge step forward. Um, the G7 actually provides about almost $80 billion in public finance or like government funds for international fossil fuel projects from 2020 to 
2022. And this is a huge number on its own, but this public finance also unlocks like a much larger amount of private finance for these fossil fuel projects. Most of the public finance is given through loans and export credit guarantees that reduce the risk, the financial risk of projects that their companies are involved with abroad. So shifting this money towards renewable energy would go a long way towards meeting the obligations of the world's richest countries. But like you said, G7 leaders actually weakened this commitment by adding in loopholes on LNG and allowing new investment in fossil fuels because of the war in in Ukraine. And Japanese officials like seized on this opening, like officials with the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, just days after the commitment said Japan would continue financing upstream oil and gas projects. So there was like a significant step forward, but like a loophole large enough to allow many new gas infrastructure projects to go forward. So now prior to any meetings that were held in Japan, so we're talking just at the beginning of say 2023, there was, as and I think you mentioned this as well, there was a significant um, amount of talk about Japan pushing through an agenda since they are the, the chair of the G7 this year, they were, they were pushing through an agenda that did have links to, to fossil fuel interests, for example. And this, in a sense, was a bit of a preview to the meeting that happened between energy meetings in Sapporo recently, the pre-G7 summit meeting. So I just wanted to get your take on that. But perhaps before we go into that specifically, I was just wondering if you can give us a tour of, of Japan's reliance on fossil fuels. How dependent is the country on things like gas and coal and and also, how is the country faring in its in its transition to, to cleaner energy? Japan is heavily reliant on imported fossil fuels for power generation. It's about like 75 percent uh, in 2019. As you probably know, like the nuclear kind of disaster in Fukushima was a huge turning point for Japan. Like out of concern for public safety, nuclear reactors were shut down in Japan advanced, developed and advanced intense um, plants to build new coal plants and ramp up its LNG use. But at the same time, like Japan actually needs to phase out coal, reduce reliance on LNG. It needs to go in the opposite direction. The Japanese corporate interests are so powerful and they're driving government policy. There's a really interesting report, a really important report that just came out a couple months ago from some research into researchers in Berkeley that actually like looked at Japan's energy situation and saw that Japan has significant potential to scale up renewables. Um, they thought Japan could like scale up its solar PV and wind and other renewables to 70% by 2035. So there is a pathway towards decarbonizing Japan's electricity sector. But right now there's no political will. You mentioned the uh, the corporate sector in Japan being really powerful. Is this a handful of companies or is this, uh, I guess, a consortium of, of many companies in Japan? The entrenched fossil fuel interests are big and broad <laughs> in Japan. It ranges from JRA, which is like the biggest power producer in Japan, one of the biggest LNG importers globally, to developers, to trading houses like Mitsubishi and Mitsui that are involved in some of the biggest, baddest oil and gas projects globally, to the big Japanese mega banks, SMBC, Mizuho, and MUFG. They're some of the top financiers for fossil fuels globally. So going back to my earlier point about the meeting that happened in Sapporo recently between energy ministers, um, perhaps we can go over the good news first. Uh, which is there was some big commitments made there at that meeting by um, by some energy ministers there. So, for example, they wanted to they committed to a you know a big increase in renewable energy. I'm just wondering what your reaction was to these commitments, and and do you think unlike last year, the G7 is showing more leadership on on decarbonization and, and clean energy? You know, it, it's critical that the G7 scale up support for renewables. It's, it's so important uh, for the global energy transition. 
And at the same time, these commitments are absolutely undermined by the G7's continuing support for fossil fuels. To be totally honest, like the G7 has to show, has to do like much, much more to show real climate leadership. It needs to end international public finance for fossil fuels without exception, needs to close the door to new investments in gas, and it has to commit to domestic coal phase out by 2030. At the recent April ministerial meeting, they're still not agreeing on a timeline for coal phase out, which seems like just like almost like step one in the process of taking action to decarbonize um, electricity sectors and take real action on climate. And in addition, they need to stop approving new licenses for oil and gas projects and new LNG infrastructure. Like one thing I just wanted to say is that You know, the G7 claimed that it actually ended its international public finance for fossil fuels at the April ministerial. But it's honestly just a big lie. Like Japan approved a new gas project in Uzbekistan a couple months ago. Italy approved financing for new oil and gas infrastructure in Brazil. And like we've talked about, they left the door open for more investments in gas. It it isn't progress or climate leadership. And honestly, it doesn't bode well with Japan at the helm of the G7 right now, backing LNG expansion, ammonia co-firing, and other dirty fossil technologies. How important is is leadership on energy by the G7? I, I just wanted to drill down on that for a bit. How much do their decisions really affect the globe? And, and what kind of example do you think this sets for for other countries in in the globe, say, for for example, the the G20 countries? The the G7 is, as you know, is made up of the world's richest countries. They account for 40% of the world's economic activity and a quarter of global carbon emissions. They have an obligation to act unequivocally and with urgency to lead the global transition to renewable energy. And they're they're honestly wasting valuable time. The window to meet our climate goals is, is is shrinking. And Japan's, in particular, is headed in the opposite direction. The U.S. is doing no better with its recent approval of the Willow oil drilling project and the Alaska LNG terminal. What it comes down to is we all want and need a brighter future for our children where they can thrive. And those most responsible for the climate crisis, which is like imperiling our communities and our planet, the onus is on them. So G7 governments have the biggest obligation to cut emissions and their addiction to fossil fuels and take real action to help safeguard our future. Awesome. And I I just wanted to go over now the, I guess, quote unquote, bad news uh, from the meeting in Sapporo. There were there were a number of countries that were actually pushing for a, a coal phase out by 2030. And if I remember correctly, that was, I think the UK and Canada were two of those countries, but then there was pushback on this idea by countries like Japan. And I mean, the language that they agreed on at the end was, was what many people are saying watered down where they settled on quote, concrete and timely steps in accelerating domestic unabated coal power generation, unquote. I was just wondering what your reaction to this whole uh, fiasco is. And is that a, I guess, a letdown compared to an agreement on a total phase out? Yeah, it's it's a massive letdown. It's, It's a failure of leadership, simply. The science is crystal clear and has been for years and years. Like, we need to end our reliance on fossil fuels, and it includes phasing out coal. And the fact that the richest countries, like, it's been very clear that the richest countries need to do it by 2030, and yet the clock is ticking, and they can't even commit to a concrete timeline and are still, like, in many cases, like, just beholden to the coal industry. Uh, One thing to point out, is that the UK is a really positive model. Like coal accounted for like 40% of UK's power generation in 2012. And in less than 10 years, they dropped it to less than 2% in 
uh, is like, yeah, less than 2% in 2020. So Japan is actually like resisting all efforts to end coal. And yet there's that new report that I mentioned showing how Japan can largely decarbonize its power sector by 2035 and end coal. So there are actually like realistic and reasonable pathways to achieve this. Um, Japan's, like we've talked about, its resistance is based on these entrenched corporate interests that are dominating government policies on energy and climate. And they're really launching like this massive PR push right now to convince, I was thinking it's kind of like they're trying to convince governments that essentially the earth is flat, (laughs) that fossils aren't actually the primary cause behind the climate crisis and we have to keep using them. And it's like, honestly a big scam. Now, if we take into context the UK's experience, how is Japan really justifying this push of what could be akin to a stagnation of progress on clean energy? Yeah, I I agree. And I think it, I feel like it's the case in kind of country after country where like the kind of fossil fuel interests and the ministries and governments that kind of regulate them are like, are are one and the same and where there is, like you say, this revolving door. And in the case of Japan, like they, I think Japan feels like it lost the race on renewables and doesn't have the renewable technology um, to offer to other countries. So it's basically out there, but it, but it figures that they've been importing LNG for decades. And so their companies have this kind of expertise in gas and LNG. And so they're kind of out there trying to promote gas and fossil-based technologies. Um, They're they're doing it around the world and they're promoting them as green. But uh, but I think it's it's basically just them kind of peddling these technologies and trying to kind of shine up the same dirty technologies and push them out as like forward-looking technologies of the future when it's the same dirty technologies that got us into this mess in the first place. What do you make of the, I mean, this reminds me of uh, many of the the justifications for this being thrown around. I know the, for example, I, I mean, not just to single out Japan now, but talk about in the US, I mean, energy security has been a big uh, factor in, for example, that new um, exploration in Alaska uh, that's just been approved. And then of course, Japan has also cited energy security as a as a means to to continue, or at least in their in their case, wanting to push a um, an agenda that that basically puts forward fossil fuels as a kind of what they're I guess what they're calling a, a temporary solution to to energy security. I'm just wondering what your reaction is to to these these ideas of energy security, and, and do they hold? Do they hold much weight? Do these arguments hold much weight? Uh, Well, it's a really good question. And it's going to be top of the agenda um, in in Hiroshima at the G7. The thing is, is that the International Energy Agency has actually said very clearly that the reason for the energy and climate crises kind of worsening is actually because of the slow transition to renewable energy. And so it's quite clear that the path towards energy security is paved with renewables. And yet at the same, and, and that means no new oil and gas fields, no new LNG infrastructure. I mean, I think the war has revealed the risk of relying on expensive imported fossil fuels. Some countries have, were priced out of LNG after the war happened. And, and what happened is like there have been predictions that that they actually can't afford to buy any new cargoes, any kind of long-term cargoes. Bangladesh is a really good example. Like their reliance on imported fossil fuels has been to the detriment of, of people in the country. And there was an article that was out a few months back that said that Bangladesh would actually face rolling blackouts because they couldn't afford to purchase LNG cargoes. I think they might have had one recently, but clearly this is like one example showing that reliance on imported LNG is not a path towards energy security or stability. I think there's 
There's a bit of irony in this where you have countries citing energy security, but then you have examples like Bangladesh, which are clearly not the ideal situation for any country to have in terms of, you know, relying on on one source of uh, fuel or, or an energy resource too much, and then it actually works against your best interests in terms of energy security. Um, and I, I think there's a there's a bit of a, a a justice issue here too, where you have richer countries that can afford to pay higher prices for this infrastructure that they've already got. And then you have a country like Bangladesh, who is one of the poorest countries in the world. So what do you make of that? Is there a fundamental unfairness in what's happening in the world right now? Yeah, it's it's really insidious kind of what what's going on. Like uh, we mentioned the case of Bangladesh, like Japan, at the same time that Japan, um, that Bangladesh is facing this crisis and countries around the world are facing this crisis over expensive imported LNG, Japan was actually working to kind of hook these countries into greater reliance on imported LNG and ammonia and more. Like they, they're actually, Japan is actually writing the power master plan for Bangladesh and actually the decarbonization plan for Indonesia. And all of these plan these plans like shamelessly back the need for Japanese fossil technologies <laughs> and underplay the importance of developing renewables. And there's groups like Clean Bangladesh and Wally in Indonesia that have called Japan out for playing down the importance of renewable energy in these plans. Japan is really working overtime to derail the energy transition. And they're using this banner of energy security when it's not in the interests of these uh, host countries at all. Now, they have, for example, in in the recent, um, at, at that recent meeting in Sapporo, they have said that gas investments would quote, you know, they would meet climate objectives without creating lock-in effects, unquote. Can we take that seriously? Is that a, is that a, uh, an accurate description of, of what is, is, is in store for the world, especially in regards to, as you just mentioned, like countries like Bangladesh and Indonesia. You know, it's, it's so problematic. It's so infuriating. There's no room in terms of emissions to like lock in new gas, oil and coal infrastructure. Like if we're actually going to mitigate and uh, avoid the very worst impacts of the climate crisis. And at the same time, these gas projects actually require to go forward a lot of the kind of importing uh, gas import terminals. They rely on 20-year contracts. And so in order to be economically and financially viable, you know, they have to kind of sign these really long-term deals to make it viable and so that the, the developers will get their kind of money back and achieve enough return. So the idea that these projects won't require lock-in, have lock-in effects is is just kind of is very misleading. Let's let's stick on the topic of of Japan and 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 the overseas issue. So now there's this new policy that they've just put out called the green transformation or otherwise known as GX. So there's been a lot of talk about how this will affect developing countries in, in Southeast Asia, like Thailand, Vietnam, and the Philippines. Could you tell us a little bit about what GX plans to do or what it's purported to do and, and how it will do this? So, yeah, as you said, Japan recently approved its GX strategy or its so-called green transformation policy that is anything but green. It's this new strategy is an exercise in greenwashing that, as we've been talking about, purely benefits Japanese corporate interests. The strategy relies heavily on fossil fuels. So it's fossil-based technologies, including LNG, the co-firing of ammonia at coal power plants, hydrogen, and carbon capture and storage. Uh, these technologies would prolong the use of fossil fuels at a time when we must urgently phase them out and when renewable energy is actually cheaper 
reliable and available. One of the big concerns is that Japan's using its diplomatic might to promote these dirty technologies at the G7 and also at ASEAN. And in fact, this year is Japan and ASEAN's 50th anniversary of cooperation. So there's a summit planned in December where it's likely that Japan will continue to promote these technologies. They've also kind of convened this Asia Zero Emissions Community Initiative to basically build some support and demand for these technologies. So they're both selling the technology, but kind of manufacturing the demand uh, from from governments across Southeast Asia. What's the reaction been, if, if you can comment on the reaction in, in Southeast Asia? Are, are governments quite receptive to this plan or... Or is there, has there been some questioning or any pushback? There were a slew of deals that were signed in March around the, um, the Asian Zero Emissions Community Ministerial that Japan organized. I think, I think there's not a lot of uh, understanding about these technologies and the impact they'll have in terms of the transition. And so it's really critical to share more information about the risks that these pose. There's... You know, the richest governments have an obligation to provide climate finance to help countries in the global south transition. And they're wasting these funds on technologies that that will likely end up being kind of uneconomic or end up as stranded assets. They're also kind of wasting time as well as kind of capital and money by advancing these projects. And so I think it's really critical to kind of get that message out and to kind of for for governments to understand the risks that that Japan is kind of imposing on them. Do you see this, uh, do you see the GX affecting, for example, like a country like Vietnam has seen really great progress in, in terms of clean energy. Do you see a, a policy like GX potentially derailing this progress that's been made? Oh, absolutely. And I, I think Vietnam is a really good case. Um, there's been a significant delay in finalizing the latest power development plan. And I think it's because from what I've seen from kind of recent news clippings is that leaders are concerned because they've actually committed to reach net zero, uh, I think by 2050. And so they're actually realizing that, like, they're actually trying to look at the math and the science to see, like, what level their emissions need to be at and kind of trying to reconcile that with their power mix uh, by 2030. And so it's caused, I think, a lot of delay because I think they're looking at like how to actually support grid development and renewables in order to meet those targets. I think they're doing the deliberate planning and uh, taking pause um, from kind of business as usual to actually meet their climate objectives. It's something that Japan should take note of. And actually all the companies that are wanting to invest and push fossil fuels in countries like Vietnam, because it poses a huge risk. They are like Japanese business interests are kind of banking on the fact that countries across Southeast Asia and globally will be receptive to these strategies. But the thing is, as climate policies change within each country, I think there's a huge risk that these projects will end up being stranded or abandoned. And so I think it's not only risky for our climate and for the host countries, but also for Japan and the and its corporate backers. And speaking of going back to the G7, has there been any uh, chatter from G7 countries regarding Japan's GX policy? Yeah, thankfully, the UK, the US and Canada pushed back against Japan's dirty energy plans, including the push for like ammonia co-firing. Apparently, it was uh, the source of like kind of heated discussions uh, leading up to the ministerial. And so it was really significant. I think Japan was looking to the G7 to endorse its fossil-based technologies. And there was significant resistance, which is a, a relief, to be honest. But they but they actually like carved out this loophole on gas investments, which is really concerning. And in addition, the Japanese government and media have been interpreting, you know, the kind of 
tepid kind of uh, mention of ammonia co-firing in the G7 communique as an explicit endorsement by the G7 of Japan's energy strategy, which is very concerning. They're spinning it as if the G7 is backing their plans when that's far from the truth. Great, Susan. And I, and I just had one last question before before we go in. And I know this is probably a big question, but um, what would you like to see happen at the G7? And also, of course, this will lead into other conferences like the G20 and also, importantly, COP28 in Dubai later on this year. What does an ideal scenario look like for you? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for asking. What the G7 really needs to do, and as energy security will be at the top of the agenda, and Japan will continue to push kind of these dirty technologies at the G7, there needs to be clear action to end international public finance for fossil fuels. Full stop, like no exception. That is a significant move that the G7 countries need to make to show the climate leadership that is desperately needed and that, like I mentioned, is an obligation as like those most, the countries that are most responsible for the climate crisis to end financing of fossil fuels. They need to close the loopholes on new gas investments. We heard that Japan is going to continue to push for exceptions around gas. They need to close this door. It's really critical, especially since they're saying that this G7 will kind of set the tone for, like you say, the different international events that are happening and leading up to COP in UAE, which is of huge concern given that it's a major oil and gas producing country. It's honestly not voting well, but I just wanted to end with one bright light. There is a movement that is growing, that is strengthening against gas expansion. There's the Don't Gas Africa movement that started, I think, last year. The Asian People's Movement on Debt and Development and partner groups launched the Don't Gas Asia campaign just last week. And they're demanding a just and equitable transition to renewable energy. And this movement will only continue to grow in power and strength. And it's critical that the G7 heeds their call. Awesome, Suzanne. And I just want to say again, thank you so much for for coming on and, and offering your insights and and thoughts on this on this really important matter. I was just wondering before you go, if you could share where we can find you or where we can follow you or where we can follow your, your organization's work. Uh, thanks so much. So I encourage the listeners to visit our coalition webpage, fossilfreejapan.org. We're actually organizing a global week of action leading up to the G7, and there's already probably more than 20 actions planned in maybe 15 or so countries. The list is kind of growing. Um, There's actions planned from Bangladesh to the Philippines to the U.S. and U.K. and even Australia, where you are. And so I encourage folks to, like, follow along, help amplify, and find out what they can do to help stop Japan's dirty energy strategy. Awesome. Thank you so much. If you found this episode valuable, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, share it with your friends or colleagues, and visit our website at energytracker.asia for more. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time on Energy Insights.